Hey, SEG Church, my name is Matt, and we're so glad you're here, especially if it's your first time at SEG. I want to give you a warm welcome. Please stop by our Welcome Center in the lobby to learn more about who we are and to get to know some of our friendly staff and volunteers. Look, we have a lot going on at SEG that you need to know about. Start with the first thing. The women are organizing their own party on May 11th, and they're having their second annual Mother's Day tea. This event sells out so quick, and so you're going to want to reserve your spot soon. Next, the men are starting a three-week men's study on the book of Joshua, and it starts May 16th at 7 p.m. Discover how Joshua's journey can inspire your spiritual growth and lead you towards a deeper connection with Jesus. Next, here at SEG, we value the hearts and minds of our little ones here at Seacoast. And that's why we're excited to announce the expansion of our Christian school to include TK, kindergarten, and first grade classes. Here we provide a safe, biblically grounded education for your children. To learn more or to register, visit our website, scdchurch.org. Then on the following weekends, we have baptisms. If you have committed your life to Christ, then your next step of faith is making it public. We will have baptisms during our three weekend services, and there is a mandatory class that will be taking place on May 13th. We're so excited to celebrate this faith milestone with you so check out our website to register for more information next in the month of august we're so excited to host our marriage conference here at seacoast join us for the resist the drift a two-day marriage conference where couples will receive biblically based concepts and tools to strengthen their marriages now all these events are on our website but you could also visit the tables in our courtyard to learn more next we just want to say thank you for continuing to support the work god is doing here at seg you can continue to give online or in person as you head out today at the black offering boxes. Now, if you're interested in discovering ways that you can serve others here at SCG, we'd love to have you join one of our volunteer teams. Scan the QR code on the screen to help us get you plugged into the right spot. Look, there's a lot going on at SCG that you can be a part of, so stay up to date on the latest events by checking out all the tables in the courtyard, and then follow us on our social media pages or visit our website, scgchurch.org. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to church. Great to see you. Come on, let's stand together. Hey, let's do this. Can you find a few people around you? Just say, welcome to church. And if you're ready, you can put your hands together like this. Come on. Here we go. He shames every idol. He reigns without a rival. He goes by the name of Jehovah. Jeremy, 
Yes, he will. Jehovah Rapha, heal your body. My God. Jehovah Shalom, be your peace. Come on, call his name. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battle. That's my shepherd, 
my protector that's my king that's my rock he's my anchor talking about can you just shout amen he's been so good and so faithful if it's all right can we just continue to talk about his goodness and his mercy let's worship together see you do everything on purpose and i can feel your spirit stirring oh i've been praying you've been working Working it all from good So fan the flame and keep it burning Cause you're refining in the furnace Oh, all the waiting will be worth it Cause you're working it all from good If you've seen him work before, can you say this? Miracle after miracle Open door after open door Here it comes So get ready for another one Cause another one is on Say miracle Miracle after miracle Open door after open door Here it comes So get ready for another one Cause another one is on the way 
one is on the way. Can you just lift this up in expectation? Can we say miracle together? Miracle after miracle, open door after open door. Here it comes, so get ready for another one. Cause another one is on the way. Hey Amen. You may be seated. There's a scripture that's been stuck on my mind for the past two weeks. It's in Lamentations. It says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. And I don't know whether it's the season you just came out of or the season you're in or the season you're about to step into, but could you just say this word and encourage yourself? Say hope. Hope is that gear that gets the engine moving. And we just want to remind you that there's things that we do here at Seacoast Grace as a community, as a family, to recall to our minds the very reason we have hope in, our, in every season. We take part in communion together. And if you came in, you might have been handed the elements. Uh, if you haven't, you could just raise your hand and someone will get that to you. And we practice this or we take part in this to remember the hope that we have found in Jesus Christ. And if this is your first time here, I want to park in this moment and say, hi, we're so glad you're here. Even if you're just watching online to arrive at this space, I don't know what it is that you could be going through, but here in this this family, if I can be so bold to say, we believe in hope. And we like to take time to let hope do what hope does. So we're just gonna park right here and just let there be some scriptures on the screen that can recall to our minds the reason why we have hope. And then we're gonna have one more moment of worship if that's all right. and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb cause your name is the highest to your name is the greatest in your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions in your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry
tu nombre es más alto, tu nombre es más grande, tu nombre sobre todo es dominios y tronos, poderes y reinos, tu nombre sobre todo es tu nombre. Más alto tu nombre es más grande tu nombre sobre todo es dominios y tronos poderes y reinos tu nombre sobre todo es and the angels cry sing it oh all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever can you lift your hands with me this time hear your people sing sing out holy to the king of kings, holy, you will always be, holy, one more time, holy forever, and the angels cry, and the angels cry, lift it up, holy, all creation, I lift it high, holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing. Hear your people sing. Holy to the King of Kings. Oh, you will. honor your name. The only name that saves. The only name that heals. The only name where we find our hope. Scripture says you've been given a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. Father, I thank you that we have access to your presence today where we can freely worship, where we can freely lift our hands, we can lift our voice to a good God, to a most holy God. I thank you for these moments. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Church, we love worshiping with you. You may be seated. Well, good morning. You know, it's important, uh, that, that last song, I think it's appropriate that we finish singing about God's holiness. Um, God's holiness is, uh, well, I was, I've been reading um, the Old Testament quite a bit lately, and, and uh, you know, the Israelites are always living among other people groups, uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, and uh, uh, the, the, the history of Israel is the, the, the uh, ongoing challenge of keeping God, the true God, the one and only true God, the holy God, as their focus, as their priority. 
uh, as their Lord, their God, and, uh, and they constantly are being drawn away from that idea into worshiping of other gods, uh, in, involve themselves in debauchery in the name of other gods. And, and when we come together, like the children of Israel of old, we have to be reminded of who it is that we worship and who it is that we serve, whose name we are called by. It is not just a God, not just any God. It's not a concept of God. It's not a theory. It is God, holy God. And holy talks about God's perfection and that he is set apart, that his name is like no other name. You're saying, well, we don't, we don't live in a polytheist. Oh, sure we do. We have the God of greed, the God of lust. There are lots of gods. Lots of things that could distract us from the one true God. So when we come together, we sing to God, about God, for God, and we are reminded uh, to whom we belong. We belong to God. And as God is set apart and is holy, we are to be set apart and holy as well. And so we begin to find ourselves living differently because who we belong to whose God uh, Yahweh is, Jehovah is, the God of Scripture is, and we live differently. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the ways that that, that happens, and in I know, a really good way, I think. And um, we will end again talking about uh, God's holiness. So I want to kind of use for a metaphor today for something that we don't really experience on the West Coast, but I grew up in the Midwest and you experience it a lot. And I guess you could here, but it, you got to kind of almost make yourself do it. And that's about getting stuck, like in a snowbank or in mud. Most of our roads are paved, right? Right around here anyway, unless you're in Baja on the sand or something. I don't know. Uh, most people don't worry about getting stuck out here. But in the Midwest, it's a real deal. One time I was uh, uh, coming home from college with my then girlfriend, now wife, and uh, we, were, we were driving from Springfield, uh, Missouri, with an A, um, uh, uh, <laughs> up toward my parents' house, which you go through St. Louis, and then you go across the river in the Illinois side, and then about an hour from my parents' house, you turn, you turn north. And uh, this particular trip was pretty uneventful. I don't remember anything about it, really, except we got through St. Louis. And when we turned north, all of a sudden, we realized that it had gotten very cold. The wind was coming from the east, just whipping across the road. Have you ever been to a cold winter's night in the Midwest where it, the, the snow was blowing and, and all you could see is this little blowing snow in front of you, the darkness of the pavement? And, and, uh, but we were fine, so we're going along. And I went to pass a truck, and what I didn't realize was how strong that wind really was and that I was driving on ice. I didn't realize I was on ice until I went (coughs) to go past that truck, and the minute I got in front of that truck and that wind hit me, I just spun it out, ended up in a ditch. Me, car, girlfriend, not a good set. I mean, not a good uh, good, uh, situation. And uh, and it was cold, and I I was able, because Illinois is flat, anything above it, like more than a foot, foot and a half, you can see it for like 10 miles. So I could see up the next overpass, and there was a uh, gas station and lights, so I could tell there would be a tow truck there. So we just had to get there, and uh, and unfortunately a car stopped, and they only had room for one passenger, so I put Connie in, shut the door, said I'll meet you at the gas station. And a weird thing happened to me. The minute I shut that door, I went, what did I just do? I just put the woman I love in a car with people I don't know to take her I don't know where and do I don't know what, and I panicked. And I was a little better shape. Okay, I was in a lot better shape back then. And I found myself just instinctively in an all-out sprint for the mile and a half it took to get to that gas station. And, and I don't even feel, I didn't remember feeling the cold or anything. I was just so upset with what I'd just done without thinking about it because I didn't want to be in the car and be cold all this time. And I got there and I walked in and I, I still remember standing there and, and she was looking at uh, uh, like snack things and, and I was just so relieved. Yeah, so part of what I want to talk about today is being stuck, but I also want to talk about your stuckness impacts other people. So I put a car in a ditch not good for me or the car, but really not good when I send my, my future wife off with some strangers somewhere without much forethought. The reality is that we get to points in our life where we get stuck. Sometimes we just get stuck. We're stuck. We're not making any progress. We're not moving forward. We're not going anywhere. And sometimes we want to get out of that when we finally realize it. But what we need to understand is we not only need to get out of that for ourselves, and I'm gonna, I hope this is maybe the most important thing I'll, I'll show you today, is that you need to get out of that for others. There's someone else that may be depending on you getting unstuck. 
So here's my theory about stuckness. And you say, well, what is stuck? What is, I don't know. We'll talk about it. I, I think there's two kinds. This is just me. This is not scripture. It's just first chapter of Doyle. I think there's two kinds of stuck. I think there's the, the God stuck and the self stuck. I have been in, in places, maybe you have two in your life, uh, where you were stuck, but you're there because God stuck you there. I remember one time in my life, I felt a calling, a prompting. I was supposed to go start a church. I went to my boss and said, hey, I want to go start a church. She said, no. And the doors closed right in my face. But I was really sure that I was supposed to do this. What I later found out was I had the right idea at the wrong time. And so for two years, I was stuck. Sometimes God sticks you in a hard place to grow you up. If you, any of the, any of the great leaders of the, the Bible, if you, almost all of them, if you study them, you realize that God took them at some point and stuck them in a place for them to grow, to develop, to grow in their character, to grow in their faith, to grow. So sometimes you're stuck because God has you there. And if you realize that's the case, then the only thing to do is grow because the only way to get out is to grow. <laughs> Grow to the point, grow up to the point where God can now move you on to the place of, of service and mission that he intended for you all along. So sometimes we're, we're God stuck. But in my life, most of my stuckness has been Doyle stuck. <laughs> it's been self stuck because I got my eyes off God. I got my eyes off what's supposed to be happening and I got distracted by something else and drove off the road spiritually. Just kind of forgot about God. Or I got my eyes like Peter on the circumstances, the wind and the waves, and I kind of, I, you, ever, you ever look over your shoulder and realize that you kind of turn the wheel when you do that? We do that spiritually. Oh, what's that over there? We're in the ditch before we know it. So today I want to talk about, because this self-stuck, the longer we stay stuck, uh, and, 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 and it's not God's intention, uh, the more uh, we tend towards some pretty toxic things. Uh, bitterness narcissism, because the only way to justify staying stuck is to try to figure out a way to blame it on everybody else. None of us want to say, I'm stuck and it's my fault. We want to find somebody to blame. And when we do that, it only leads to bitterness and, and uh, cynicism. And so uh, getting unstuck is extremely uh, important. Um, how do you know if you're self-stuck or God-stuck? Hey, we'll talk about that. I think, I think God will reveal that to you uh, as, we, as we kind of go along and think about this. Um, uh, one of the most important things you can do when you're stuck is uh, to realize you're stuck. If you're self-stuck, you need to realize it. Because what happens is, is the longer you stay stuck, the harder it is to get out and the more de you deteriorate in the process. So can I tell a graphic story? Three of you said yes. So we're going for it. So... Um, I, I've, been, I, I've been privileged a couple of times to take uh, some folks and, and uh, while well, we're doing some work in Africa and sneak away for a few days just to get away because we need it and do a, a, a little, uh, little intense, uh, not intense, but in structures called tents, um, we would do a little safari in Kenya. And it's not far from where we work, just a little plane hop over there. And, uh, and when you land in the Masai Mara, at least the, the, the camp that we go to, um, when you land where they built the little gravel runway, they've dug up some ponds, some holes that filled up with water became ponds. And so one of your first sights once you get off this little plane uh, and, and you look around is you see these ponds. You don't really know they're ponds because they're covered with green, like lilies, kind of plants. And, but every once in a while, you'll look over, and there'll be a big old head pop up out of that thing, and it's a hippo. And this little pond is just full of hippos. And you just look, and it's like amazing. You know, it's one of the first things you see when you get there. You're like, wow, this is cool. And then one day I asked, what are the plants on top? And they told me the name of them in a local dialect. I didn't remember what is it. And I said, oh, are they just floating? He said, no, no, they are, they are, they are anchored to the sort of earth, sort of. I said, but that's a pond. I said, okay, it's actually manure from the hippos floating on the water. And the plants anchor themselves to the manure where the hippos are floating, I mean, are, are swimming. I don't want to be too graphic, but when you allow yourself to stay stuck, okay, you make the application, but anyway. <laughs> That's a part of why it's so important that we realize that we're not making progress, that we're not moving forward, that now we're, growing, we're not growing in our faith, we're not, we're not following God closely, that we have been distracted, and like Israel of old, we need to get our eyes back on God and begin to follow him closely. So, recognize you're stuck. 
If you don't, um, you'll get stucker. You'll get more stuck. Let me, let me talk about Moses. Moses is a great uh, hero of Scripture. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Moses, um, Moses was uh, born to um, Israelite family. Uh, uh, the Israelites were uh, slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh uh, had them enslaved and abused them and uh, got mad at them at one point and decided he'd kill all the baby boys. So there wouldn't be an uprising because the, uh, the Hebrews were fairly affectionate people and had a lot of kids. That's the original Hebrew. Um, and he decided he'd kill all the baby boys. Moses' mother um, uh, outsmarted this thing, led by God. She put him in a, in, a, in a basket, took him down to the river, let Pharaoh's daughter see him. Pharaoh's daughter looked at him, said, oh, it's a cute baby. I'm going to take you home, be mine. Took him home. Moses' actual biological sister followed them. And when Pharaoh's daughter realized that somebody had to take care of this baby and she wasn't going to do it, uh, his sister said, oh, I know a woman. She's one of the Israelites. She'll come watch your baby for you and went and got Moses' mother, right? Remember that? And so Moses' mother actually took care of her own son in Pharaoh's Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh, uh, uh, Moses grows up and he is, uh, uh, receives all kinds of privilege, education. He, he sees leadership up close. He understands how is Egypt works. He just has an inside privileged view of the world. And there was a reason it was ordained that way. God intended that. He grows up. He uh, sees how his own people are being abused by their slave masters and he takes action. Unfortunately, it's the wrong action, and it gets him in really serious trouble. He has to run away. We'll read that passage in a moment, in Exodus chapter 2. And he has to run away. And so for 40 years, he's out in the desert, he's watching sheep, and he doesn't, we don't, he doesn't really seem to do much. He's just out there. He's just kind of stuck. But in this case, it's both his own getting stuck, because he misbehaved, and God had him there for a reason. And, and so what we are going to read in, in chapter three of Exodus is the end of that when he gets to get unstuck. Although he doesn't even seem to want to by this point get unstuck and we'll talk about how that becomes part of our lives. Let me read it for you. Uh, Exodus three and then, we'll, and then we'll jump down to Exodus two. Uh, Exodus three, starting with verse one. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, did not burn up. So Moses thought, and by the way, this verse and the next one, the two most important we're going to look at today. A very tiny, very seemingly insignificant, and yet they changed the course of history. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians, or from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then it goes and names all the people who presently are living in that land, but Israel will displace them. And then in verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. Now, if I'm Moses, I want more than I'll be with you. You and what army? Literally, you. And who's going with me? This, yeah. And, and if you read on, you'll find that Moses was not at all anxious. He tried this gig once. It didn't work out for him. That's how he ended up in, out in the wilderness by himself. And he wasn't very anxious. And he began to make excuses why he couldn't do it, why he wasn't able. He wasn't, he wasn't the guy to do it. And yet God just kept saying, I'll be with you. you you'll be okay. Now, if we think about uh, this, you need to realize when you're stuck and you got to try to get unstuck. And, uh, and, but the first thing is to realize you're stuck. The first time Moses tried this, he didn't realize he was stuck. God hadn't given him release yet. Sometimes we want to do something, and it might be the right thing, but at the wrong time. It was my case. It was Moses' case. Delivering his people is exactly what God wanted him to do. He just wasn't ready yet. 
Moses wasn't ready to lead yet. The situation wasn't set up yet, and God didn't say go. Uh, and he needed to stay in that growth position for a little while longer. My, my, uh, my brother, closest to my age, a couple of years younger than me, and I, in our late teens, lived out in the country, and we had a four-wheel drive. I think it was an original Bronco, if I remember right. <laughs> Wish I had that. Um, and we were out on a cold, snowy, wintry morning, and we decided to go exploring on a gravel road, and we started down this gravel road, and we quickly realized that our steering is not what is guiding us. It is the ice under our tires that is pushing us off the road, over the edge, and we're going we're to land in the trees. Start pumping the brake, finally get a stop, say, okay. But of course, we couldn't leave it alone. We decided to put it in reverse and try to get out. The minute the tire started spinning, we started moving the wrong direction toward the tree. A couple of times we tried that, and being as wise as we were, we finally decided to quit trying that because it was moving us toward the tree. And so we were about a mile and a half away from home. We went home. We had a backhoe. You guys know what a backhoe is? The one with the bucket that goes like this? It's big yellow usually. You know what I'm talking about? No? There's going to be a lot of farm illustrations here. You better hang with me. <laughs> so we go home. We, get, we go home. We get the backhoe. And we start down the road. And the same thing happens to the backhoe. It starts sliding toward the car. And we're like, oh, man. But we're like, we've got a backhoe now. What do you do? You just drop that bucket down and you just dig in for all you got and you get that thing stopped. And then, and then what you do is you put the arms, it has arm, stabilizing arms on the side. You follow me? You with me on this? And you put those arms down and then you pick the bucket up and you pull yourself, get up there, get a little hold up there, pull the arms up. Pull the, all afternoon we did that with the car chained to it. It was so much fun, really. <laughs> but the first thing in fixing this situation is we had to realize that we were stuck. We had to quit trying to do it on our own and we had to go get some help. We had to go get a backhoe. Sometimes when you're stuck, you may not even know why you're stuck or how you're stuck and you certainly won't know how to get out of it. But maybe the first thing you have to do if you realize that you're stuck somehow in your life is to, is to ask for help, is to go to God. So when finally he has done his 40 years in the wilderness, God says, okay, I'm here, I'm your help, now let's go do, do that thing. But before that, what got him in trouble was he had the right thing, he had the wrong time. So let me read that for you, just so you know how he got himself in trouble. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watching them at their, he was watching them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you kill the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. He had the right what, he had the wrong time. He had the wrong uh, who, he thought he was going to do it. He needed to depend on God to do it. And so he found himself really stuck. So how do you know if you're stuck? There was a book written about uh, 20 some years ago called Unstuck. It was a business book, not religious. It was written uh, for companies that found themselves stuck in some, some uh, part of their development. And, um, and the people were kind of losing their morale and what to do about it. It's written by Yamashita and Spataro, if I remember right. And I, and I found some of the things in there to see if you're stuck. Uh, some kind of indicators might be helpful for us today to see if you're stuck. Um, so here are some indications that you feel overwhelmed. You just feel like well, there's just too much coming, too fast. It's happening too quick. Uh, as a result, you're underachieving what you're trying to do. You can't really even figure out how to get started on some of the other stuff. You're overwhelmed. Or you're exhausted. You're beginning to shut down, feeling burnout, and starting to be uh, cynical about, about the expectations placed on you. Or you're directionless, and what work you do is mediocre, mediocre and there's no really positive outcomes, it feels like. Or hopeless, which is no motivation, lack of purpose. Seems like there's no point and I just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Or battle-worn. It's uh, too much conflict, too little trust. Um, the whole thing is dysfunctional at this point and you're just surviving on caffeine and carbs. Um, feeling worthless. Uh, there's, you're, you're not winning and there's no way. You can see no way to win in this situation. And then feeling alone. No sense of accomplishment or personal impact, and you don't feel like you're part of something greater. 
The first thing one might want to realize about being stuck is that stuck people lose perspective. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is about this. It's about under the sun. That phrase simply means looking at the world and your life situation and excluding God from that, from your life, from the possibility, the hope, the the direction, the intervention he might do. Take God out of the situation, it's hopeless. But when God is there and you choose not to acknowledge God's presence, you have a wrong perspective. You're living a false narrative. You're living according to what you can pull off, not what God can pull off. By the way, Israel, as you read on with Moses and and Israel, Moses led Israel, but it was difficult because yes, he went to uh, to Egypt and he confronted Pharaoh and they had plagues. Eventually Pharaoh lets him go and Charlton Heston leads him out into the, (laughs) it's a joke for us old people. If you're young, it was a movie. But the problem is he gets the people out of Egypt, but he can't get Egypt out of the people. They have a slave mentality. They live like people whose lives have been completely controlled. At every turn, there is no hope. There is no initiative to be taken. There is nothing to be done, and they live that way. It took an entire generation dying off until they can, that God could infuse a new amount of faith and hope so that they would trust God and go into the place that God had prepared for them called the promised land. They live with this life because when you are stuck, you don't see the real picture. You don't remember that God has a much bigger idea than you have. You can only see what you've been seeing and you can't see out of the hole that you're in. But when we include God, when we come to God, he tries to give us a mind, eyes of faith, the mind of Christ so that we can begin to see things the way maybe God is looking at them and we begin to find some hope. Stuck people lose perspective and stuck people settle. They begin to settle for less than. They settle for a purposeless life. Just kind of make it. I'm just hoping to make it through. When I was a kid, there was a, there was, there was a series of songs coming, came. I think they were probably written in the early 1900s. About, I remember one of them to this day was, Hold the Fort for I Am Coming. And the whole point was, I'm just barely going to make it. I just hope you just hold it before they kill me. And I understand I have days that way. But did Christ die on the cross for you to barely make it? Christ died on the cross for you to live victorious lives. Paul, even facing death, that was victory. He understood there was a bigger picture and God was at work. We settle for less than the lives that God has for us. We begin to hang out with some unhealthy people and inferior relationships. You want to strike up a conversation, just say something cynical. Almost anybody will talk to you because we're all cynical about something. It may not be the healthiest thing to rally around, though. Um, We begin to live reactively rather than proactively and missionally. We begin to make poor choices based on bad information, sloppy habits, and fuzzy intentions, like, I don't know, building golden calves and worshiping them, something that Israel did. You're going to worship that thing that the guy made over there? Really? Something's wrong with the perspective here, guys. You are settling for something less than what God intended for you. Um, And we begin to just wallow in old, worn-out ideas, and we don't find ourselves exposed to new ones. What does that mean? Um, In Isaiah 43, it says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. If you want to know if you're stuck, let me ask you a question, a diagnostic question. What is the cutting edge of your faith right now? What is the cutting edge of your faith? In other words, what is it in your life, your faith journey that you and God are working on right now? There's a song about, I know he lives, and we sing it at Easter time. And there is this one line in it that I love. I know he lives because I just talked to him this morning. You see, if we are moving forward in our faith, we will know the cutting edge of our faith. God may be saying, yo, that attitude, that bitterness, that cynicism, you and I, we got to get rid of that. See, if your prayer time is like my prayer time, a lot of it's thanksgiving, a lot of it's gratitude, and then there comes that point where God goes, there's something we need to talk about. What you said to your wife, that wasn't loving. That, that feeling sorry for yourself, I didn't die on the cross for you to wallow in that. that. That thing that you just hope happens, why don't you pray about it and have faith to believe that that might be something I do for you. 
You see, at any given moment, God is always calling us forward. Our relationship with Christ is always calling us forward. He's always got a next step for us. If you don't know what next step God is drawing you toward, then maybe you're stuck. And you're settling for something less than God has for you. See, the, the mindset of the, of the Israelites, the slave mindset was so inculcated and there was so much a part of their mindset. They would say stuff like, well, at least we had onions. Yeah, but you're a slave. You got beat every day. Yeah, but we had onions. Slave with onions, man. What? You see, we get used to the status quo, get used to what is and forget that there could be something else, something more, something greater that God intends for us. Stuck people lose perspective. They settle and they hide. Stuck people hide. They hide behind excuses. They hide behind circumstances and the status quo. The truth is that God may be calling you into something you can't even imagine. He might even scare the daylights out of you if you could. I bet Moses didn't know what was coming. And yet God had something amazing he wanted to do. I graduated from high school. I went to one year of high school in a little town in Illinois. In this little town, it was one hour from St. Louis. Back in the day, St. Louis used to have a lot of big concerts down by the river. It was a great place, lots of good restaurants, fun thing to go to. And most of the kids in my little tiny graduating class in that town had never been to St. Louis. It was one hour away. Most of them had never been out of the town we lived in or the county with our one stoplight. And they would say things, well, we've always lived here. Families always lived here. We've always been farmers. We've always done. I remember all the way back to my great, great grandpa when Lincoln visited here, he met him. (laughs) What? And I'm thinking, my parents, their hobby was dragging me around the world. I'd been everywhere. That was their hobby. And I'm talking to kids that haven't been more than 10 miles from home. And I'm just going, there's a whole lot more. I wonder if spiritually sometimes we anchor ourselves to something and God's going, I'll set you free from that. I'll do so much more. I mean, this, I'm going to give you the, the, the take home, and, uh, but we're not done yet, okay? <laughs> but I'll give you the take home. You need to get free, not just you, for you, but for someone else. It dawned on me this week that Moses wasn't set free from the wilderness to enjoy a comfortable life. His life was anything from comfortable from that point on. It turns out the Israelites were a pain in the neck. They were spoiled. They were rotten. They were unfaithful. They were disloyal. His life got harder. And yet, if he hadn't gotten unstuck, we wouldn't be talking about him today. Okay, this is going to sound like an overstatement. But I believe you need to get unstuck so God can show his glory through you. Me? God's glory, nowhere near me. Really? Because God's glory, one way to think about God's glory is that God's glory is to see where God has been and see the work that he's done. I have lots of friends in recovery, lots of friends of 10, 20 years sober. I look at them and I see God's glory. I look at them and I know what they used to be, either from personal experience, having known them, and them telling me about themselves. Their life used to be a mess. They used to be destructive to themselves and everybody else. And yet God worked in them, not only to bring them to sobriety, but to Christianity and to health and to wholeness. And that is God's glory, the evidence of God having worked there. You need to get unstuck so God can use you to show his glory to someone. That was good. That was just good. It was just, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I just want you to know, if you didn't get it, think about it. What do you do? What do you do when you realize you're stuck? You're not moving forward in your faith. What do you do? Um, You reconnect with what's most important, and that's God. Most of the times in my life where I was stuck, and it wasn't God's intention for me to be stuck, it was because I took my eyes off Jesus. Because I began to think about something more than I thought about him. I began to think about the circumstances, the difficulties, the COVID, as an example. Man of great faith and power I am, told our staff if they shut us down, more than a couple of weeks, we're history. We can't afford to pay the bills, and we'll have to sell the place. Because I have great faith and power, and I keep my eyes on Jesus. 
until the circumstances get tough and I look away. And like Peter, I look away from God and I start sinking and I find myself stuck and I got to get my eyes back on Jesus. Oh, yep, I forgot. I excluded you from this situation. I was under the sun thinking for a moment there. I'm back on now, Lord, I'm sorry. And I repent. And I am sorry because it's really painful when you're outside of God's will. And I really do need his forgiveness and his restoration And I really do need to have the different kind of mindset, a different kind of fruit in my life going forward. And so I repent. I come back to God and I go, I am sorry. Lord, forgive me. I know you died on the cross for me to live a different kind of life. Help me keep my eyes on you. There's a weird thing that happened. In verse three, there's a weird thing. And I'm going to try to do this quick because we're not going to get done in time. But... I'm still going to do it quick. In verses 3 and 4, I read them to you earlier. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight of why the bush is not burned up. This is just the weirdest thing to me. We don't know if it was 3 feet or 30 yards, but Moses, just this simple act of curiosity by Moses, he sees something burning. I've been in some forest fires. I would have run. Brush fires, whatever, I would have run. He didn't run. He was curious enough. There's still enough life left in him that he walked over to look at it. And it says that that was so significant. Here's how God works in our life. God does all the work and he just says, just take a little step. Just move toward me a little bit. It says, because, and it says, when God saw that Moses, God said, okay, he's ready. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get him unstuck now. And then he stops him and he says, because Moses needed to not only have a curiosity, they have courage to go forward. And so what does God do to give him courage? He gives him a holy moment. God says, stop, take your shoes off. The ground you're on is holy ground. You mean this spot between these hills? No, no, my presence, wherever my presence is, is holy ground. And you need to understand you're dealing with God, the one true almighty, holy God. Why would God have to do that? Because he needed to press on Moses. It wasn't Moses going to release his people. It was Moses going in God's name to release the people. He wasn't going by himself. He was going in God's power. You see this holy moment where he's standing on holy ground is supposed to infuse him with the courage to then go in those dark moments when Pharaoh is threatening him and he can't see the way out to go. Nope, I know. I know that I know God came with me. God called me to this. And he goes because he has a holy moment on holy ground. Just that slightest bit of initiative. I'm going to look at this. God honors that. And then he gives him a foundational experience on holy ground. He said, well, that's great for Moses. What about today? I was in a conversation in the summer of 1989 about a little white church in California with almost no people, not a single parking space, with duct tape holding the carpet down and a door tied shut with a mic stand and some rope. And in that moment, in that conversation, it wasn't what the person I was talking to said. I knew in a moment what I was supposed to do. Pick up my wife and my two little kids and move with no guarantee of income, no place to live, no place to be other than this little broken down church. But I knew, and I knew in that moment, it was holy ground. Because I knew that's what God wanted me to do. My wife at that same moment was in a grocery store And the exact same thing happened to her. Because you see, when you start a journey, an adventure, a mission, knowing that God called you to that thing, in the tough times you look back and say, no, no, I remember that holy moment. I remember that holy ground. I'm not turning back. This is a God thing. It's a powerful thing. Let me tell you you one more thing. This is the second best thing I want to say today. The other one's really good. This one's almost as good. When we repent and return to God and ask for his will in our life, and he gives us an opportunity to just get a, 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 just a sense of his presence in a holy moment, he begins to do things in us that leads us somewhere. What's the best thing God can do for you? What's the greatest gift? Salvation, forgiveness, heaven. What's the second best? You're going to think I'm going to say my wife, and she's not here, so I don't have to, but... Um, <laughs> She's number three. But calling. I'm forgiven. I'm restored in my relationship with God. But why am I here? Why am I here? 
You see what holy moments and holy ground does? Is it will. If you submit yourself to God and live in obedience, it will eventually, it will eventually reveal holy discontent. You see, Moses was right all along. He was supposed to deliver his people. You see, I believe in every one of us, God put us here for a reason. It's a part of why he let us have the experiences we had and the giftings that we have and the passions that we have. It's for a reason. There is a calling. It is some special and unique way that God is going to show his glory through each of us uniquely and individually. And when you get a moment of holy ground before God in full submission and you begin to get a glimpse of your holy discontent, I'll tell you one of mine. I don't like to see little kids starve. You're saying, well, nobody likes it. No, I mean, I don't. I can't handle it. I, I can't eat. Not, not like for an hour, like for weeks. I've, I, for some reason, God has put me in places in the world where I've seen more starvation than I ever want to see. I've seen some terrible things. And it so disturbs me. And for weeks, I'm not okay. But let me tell you something. It's worth seeing those things because you know what I get to do? I get to come back and I get to talk to people like you and we get to write checks and we get to feed little kids. And we've done it again and again and again. You see, when God allows you to be in a position to address your holy discontent, then you'll never doubt why you're on this earth. I sent that check to those people in Gulu Town, Uganda, in a war-torn region where they had made children into soldiers. One check to help and start a trade school for the kids they'd recovered who were so messed up. They all needed therapy. They all needed help. And another check to begin to feed them while they were there. I didn't, I, I didn't have a doubt why I was on this earth. The greatest gift is salvation. The second greatest is understanding your holy discontent and doing something about it. See, you know another one of mine? I really can't stand the thought of people not going to heaven. I, I don't do well. Because I believe the Bible teaches heaven's real. And the greatest hope that any of us can have is to spend eternity in our Creator's presence, having been forgiven by Jesus Christ. I believe that with all my heart. It is a discontent for me to think that there are people who don't know that message who haven't been talked to in a way that they could understand it. That is a huge, holy discontent. And you know what God has allowed me to do for so many years now? Every week, publicly and privately, I get to address that. You see, in your life, there's some discontent. And you're looking and going, well, the world is just a mess. Everybody's discontent. But no, but you're uniquely discontent. You're discontent about some very specific injustice some specific things that God wants to address. And guess who's supposed to be addressing them? You. We can bemoan the condition of the world, the culture is failing, yada, yada, but are we sitting in our little mud puddles spinning our wheels? Or are we getting traction to change our world? Well, that's a big thing. Moving Israel out of Egypt was fairly large. One man, Moses, couldn't even speak well, but God said, I'll go with you. Wilberforce wanted to stop slavery, wanted to abolish slavery in the UK and eventually the United States, and he did because his deepest joy was in God and freedom, and he thought everybody should, and he just couldn't abide by the fact that it was still happening. I'll finish with this. <laughs> I saw a picture recently, and it was a tractor, and somehow this tractor had driven off into a bog, you know, like a swamp. And this poor tractor, the whole front end it was under, you can even see the front wheels. And the hood is just barely the end of his ticket. But the back wheels, you can see from about the axle up. And it was really funny because it didn't look like a tractor because the wheels had been spinning. You'd been trying to get unstuck so much that the wheels had all of the treads had filled in. They looked like glazed donuts. <laughs> he wasn't going anywhere. He was going to need some serious help to get unstuck. I've seen people walking through life looking like glazed donuts. They've been spinning their wheels so long it feels normal. They've given up on the world, given up on hope, given up on bringing any real change. It's just going to be the way it is. I don't think that's why Christ came to the cross. I think he came because things need to change. I look in the mirror once in a while, I see glazed donuts. More way than once. <laughs> and if I see that empty look in my eye, that beginning of cynicism hopelessness, bitterness. I know it's time to get back on my knees 
start talking to the one who created me, the one who died for me, the one who saved me, and the one who called me. The problem with our world is not that those people are messing up. And see, you and I have been spinning our wheels. It's time that we kind of commit ourselves to God in a way that he can start giving us some traction to bring some hope, some love, some salvation, some truth to the world we live in. Life's too short to spin your wheels for all of us. And that's not God's intention. So today, I invite you to ask for God's help to get unstuck. And let's see what he might do in us and through us to show his glory to a world that really needs to see something besides strife and conflict. Would you agree? Can we do that together? Let's pray. Lord, I, like most people, more often than not, consider it a lost cause, the world I live in. And yet, Lord God, that is not what you called me to. You called me to keep my eyes on you and to be hopeful, to take those holy ground moments that I've had and to stand on them as foundations that you would like to provide those kinds of moments for others, the kind of hope and the kind of traction you've begun to give me is if I'll be obedience to you. If all of us, Lord God, if all of your people began to aspire to that and pray for that, then desire that and allow our holy discontent to rise to the point where we're willing to take some sort of action, no matter how small it might be, like Moses, that one step of curiosity to see if you would meet us there. How different would the world be? Lord, we need a different world. We need a different kind of mindset. We need a different kind of love, a different kind of hope. And you're the only answer, Lord God. The world is stuck. Help us get unstuck and to trust you for more every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here, guys. God bless.